people don't understand why or how I do what I do on a daily basis. My job and call in this world is to make sure that you don't die. I'm not talking about a physical death. I'm talking about the millions of people who have believed a lie of who they are and who we are to each other. When you're 12, you're not aware of what you're meant to do in this world. At that time, I didn't understand what God was trying to make me see. Some of you might say, what was the universe saying to me? What was my path in life? And I didn't understand this lie that we have all bought into. My name is Catalina Morales, and I'm a Mexican immigrant. I was born in the state of Morelos in Mexico, and I was raised in Illinois. I learned so much when my, parent, my mom decided to migrate back to Mexico. We went back, and I lived there for a year and a half. And in that year, I learned things about life that I wouldn't have if my mom had never taken me back. You see, when we came back to the United States, when I was 14, we had to cross the border through the river. And I kept asking myself, why me? Why us? I was halfway through the river. I had fallen four times, and the grocery bag where I put a dry change of clothes had fallen into the water. And I was dizzy. As I nearly drowned, I remember looking up at the sun. It was a clear and sunny day, what anyone would call a beautiful day. And I remember asking myself, why is it that I don't get to cross this border like everyone else? Why is it that my friends in Illinois right now are probably at the mall and I'm here? almost dying. Fast forward, now I'm 27, and I have searched for the answer to this question over and over again. And I've noticed that most people in this country like to see immigrants and refugees through two different lenses. At least you pity me, poor, uneducated, traumatized, or you're scared of me. Drug dealers, rapists, criminals an unfair competitor. In reality, we're all so diverse, and we don't all migrate to this country because our countries are third world countries. In 1994, when my parents migrated to the United States, they weren't fleeing violence, and they didn't want to stay here. They were coming to work for a few years to save up enough money to build their home in Mexico, and then to invest in an ice cream business. They were entrepreneurs. And maybe they would have succeeded without coming here. But there was a lie they believed. A lie that maybe many of you here still believe in. The American dream. The land of the free. Where money grows on trees. Where there's endless possibilities in such abundance that they could come to the country and work and this country would benefit from their labor and they would benefit to save up the money that they needed. This is a lie that many people from other countries believed about the United States at that time. Unfortunately, I've lived in this country for over 20 years and I have no clue where this American dream is. <laughs> this is because it doesn't exist for most of us, you and me. In that time, my parents bought a home and they lost it. They worked three jobs to pay for this house, and they couldn't declare bankruptcy because undocumented immigrants aren't allowed to declare bankruptcy. At the same time, they got a divorce, and my mother became a single mom. She lost her job because of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. This agreement between Canada, the US, and Mexico was advertised in Mexico as the thing that would put the country on the map. It would create jobs and investment into the country. The reality is another story. In the US, it created the conditions for what happened in Flint, Michigan. It decimated the middle class. But what people don't understand is that it also decimated the middle class in Mexico. 
At the same time when this was happening, my mom couldn't find a job because most employers in our town had implemented E-Verify, a system that employers can implement to verify if people's social security number is valid. She was also getting pulled over and fined for not having a valid driver's license. We lost everything and we became homeless in the winter. In that time, when we were homeless, she couldn't apply for government housing or any government help because none of us had valid social security numbers. My mom, by then, had been living and working in this country paying her taxes for over a decade and couldn't receive any support. Let me clarify this. The most prevalent lie about us immigrants in this country is that we play the system, that we rip off the government and our neighbors. This is a lie that is told, while the truth is that the US government has refused to provide my family and other undocumented immigrants a valid social security number. But they do provide us an ITIN number that allows us to pay taxes on the work that we're not legally allowed to do. When I was 23, I applied for DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. At that time, I was working three jobs that really didn't care if I was there or not, and I had been trying to get into school. This is where I learned about organizing. I started getting involved with a local faith-based organization, Isaiah. They came to my church and talked about faith and justice. I was a bit worried about getting involved, but I was also feeling motivated since now I had a two-year permit. This two-year permit provides you a valid social security number, it allows you to get out a driver's license, and be legally hired to work. As long as I didn't find myself in any legal trouble in those two years, I could apply to renew the permit, pay the government again, and then if they approved it, I was set for another two years. And then you keep doing this, because DACA has no pathway to residency or citizenship. Through organizing is where I learned about Raquel and Jose. You see, my job as an organizer is to go into the community, hear people's stories, find what motivates them to keep going, and then from there, fight through a path of dignity so that they can fight for own, their own rights. Raquel and Jose had been living in the country for over 20 years. She's from Mexico and he's from Honduras. Now Raquel and Jose, when he arrived to the country, he was struggling with alcoholism. He ended up getting two DUIs, and because of this, had to constantly go into immigration check-ins. 20 years later, he was a father with two US citizen children, a homeowner, very involved in his church ministries, a business owner, and a recovering alcoholic. After this past election, immigration called him in and told him that they were going to deport him. Raquel tried to move mountains to stop his deportation, but nothing worked. He was deported this last September. In Honduras, there's a civil war happening right now. Not a place you want to send your children, and it is in Raquel's home country. His mistakes from 20 years ago are what counted in the end of the day. I kept asking myself, what would have stopped his deportation? What kind of campaign could I have developed to stop this type of separation of families? And one thing was clear. We start talking about immigrants too late in the story. Not immigrant story, this country story. You see, I noticed that this country does a really good job talking about immigrants as if we're a distant relative or an in-law. And what we need to do is to start talking about why we migrate here in the first place. The reason I say this is because many countries, like Mexico, have high numbers of people that migrate to here, to this country, because of this country's involvement in our country's politics and policies. Don't get me wrong, I'm not letting my country of origin off the hook when I say this, but what I am saying is that this US government would owe us too much if they admitted to this. People say, go back to your country. Stop taking our jobs. But what they don't see is that I was forced into this country. 
My parents might not have migrated here because they were fleeing anything, but I did. When my mom took me back to Mexico when I was 12, she couldn't find a job. Factories were paying people $40 per week because of the NAFTA agreement, and still are. I saw the level of poverty this had created. The farmers in my home country couldn't farm corn anymore because the American government subsidized American corn and created the conditions where my, the farmers of my home country could not compete. They could no longer feed themselves or their families. My mother couldn't see a future for me in Mexico anymore, and this is why we came back. When NAFTA was signed, it created open borders, but for who? It created open borders for these wealthy corporations that keep profiting off of the exploiting, exploitation of my community and yours. How is it that these corporations with billions of dollars can set up shop wherever they please, decimate farmland, steal it from the indigenous people without any consequences? How is it that they can pay people whatever they want without any regulation and destroy our environment? but I can't find a pathway to citizenship after 24 years. Because money is what open borders and closes them, and I don't have any. Because we value money crossing borders more than we value human beings. Because if people keep focusing on Jose as an individual, they don't have to see what's behind the shades and realize that these wealthy corporations keep profiting, profiting off of exploiting our communities. Standing up for immigrants would not be seen as an act of charity anymore. It would be seen as an act of solidarity and restitution. When I started this talk, I said I was a Mexican immigrant. But if I'm honest, I'm among the most vulnerable. I'm a person without a country. I live in fear every day of our US government, and I realize that I can't go back home to Mexico and be safe anymore, or even seen as a Mexican citizen. The leaders of Nazi Germany blamed Jews for the lack of job opportunities, jobs, and poverty. They used dehumanizing language and called them cockroaches, pigs, and literally subhumans. This type of genocide happened because people stayed on the sidelines and watched and believed that lie. Will it take this type of genocide today of immigrants in this country for us to realize that it is not an act of charity to stand up with immigrants? To stand up with immigrants today is an act of recognition of our shared humanity and struggle and it's the only path to liberation for all of us. Thank you.